I've been uncomfortably conscious of my body since a young age. I'm fat, you see, so this consciousness was forced upon me. People loved to remind me that I was fat, and this included when I started to work. I have a decade's worth of experience in the catering industry, and over that time, I became very accustomed to the fact that people think that they can treat you however they like. What that translated to were thankfully only semi-regular comments about my appearance. It wasn't every day, but it wasn't never either. In those moments, my body belonged to the customers. Also, I could earn some money in order to, at first, buy video games, though later in life, obviously, the priority became food and bills. You know, adult stuff. Quite literally, my body would be temporarily on loan for the sake of the betterment of someone else's pockets. Sure, I got my allotted hourly wage, but I was also giving over parts of myself, both physical and psychological. The physical part of my body would be exhausted from the constant moving around, the psychological part the same from having to perform for those I'm serving. I'm not going to act like I've had the hardest time in the world when it comes to work. I'm in quite a comfortable position fortunately, now anyway. But it did teach me that fundamentally you have to give up your body. Whether it be the whole thing or only parts of it, a tough lesson to learn as someone who had the kind of othered body that I have. Chris Schelling, referencing Pierre Body, wrote in The Body Politic, Political Economy and the Human Body, that acts of labour are required to turn bodies into social entities, and that these acts influence how people develop and hold the physical shape of their bodies, and learn how to present their bodies through styles of walk, talk, and dress. Far from being natural, these represent highly skilled and socially differentiated accomplishments which start to be learned early in childhood. As it develops, the body bears the indisputable imprint of an individual's social class. I certainly dress in a particular way in order to make myself more comfortable, both in work and non-work environments and I know that the former certainly influenced how comfortable I felt in certain items of clothing. On the point of class, this too is reflected in how my body is developed. I feel it's important to note I'm not working class, despite some arguments that suggesting if an individual is someone that works for others they are part of the working class, because thanks to my parents and their middle class standing I fit within that bracket, and so I'm able to afford reasonably nice clothing, though I'm not exactly putting on anything designer. So of course, those within the working class can't hold their body exactly as they might like to. They can't preserve it as safely as someone in a different class bracket might be able to, and are forced into work, resulting in that difficult position of exchanging their body for minimal capital. Conversely, those who don't have to work, or whose jobs might be hard to classify as work because they exploit the work of others, you know, seize the means of production, yada yada, are afforded the opportunity to do what they want with their bodies. Less time on work means more time spent at the gym to maintain your health, more time to cook healthy food and keep your living space clean, and so on. That begs the question, what might the future hold for the body? Over the past century or so, we've had steadily evolving ideas over what the future looks like, definitely in part because of the rapid boom of technology, which has drastically changed in 100 years. In terms of those media representations, we can go back to 1927 with Fritz Lang's Metropolis, arguably an early presentation of cyberpunk as a genre, even if the pillars of that genre weren't established until later. Move forward a few decades, and we get the works of authors like Philip K. Dick and William Gibson, both of whom explored ideas of consciousness and how the body fits into a technology-focused future. There's also works like Katsuhiro Otomo's Akira, a text born from post-war Japan, observing the country's fast-paced advancement, while also dealing with the ramifications of nuclear devastation. Similarly, in the 90s we saw a strong exploration of themes like what a body and existence can even be in anime, with works like Ghost in the Shell and Serial Experiments Lane. In particular, works like that of Gibson and Otomo look at the dangers of capitalism, and how much of a desire this specific economic structure has to consume everything around it. Just look at Akira, a film that features a monstrous body created by the failures of a government that was unable to look after the poorest of its people. It's only natural then that these themes are being picked up by video games, often containing the same messages that these early works frequently espoused, which I think can be surmised pretty easily. Work is shit, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Hi, my name is Ashin, but you can call me B, and I use pretty much any pronoun, though I have a strong preference for they, them. Welcome to my first essay for Game Assist. Please be nice to me, I'll cry otherwise. I'll keep this bit brief, but please do consider subscribing to the channel if you aren't already, and if you don't want to miss any of our essays, make sure to have the bell turned on. If you like the work we do and want to offer us some extra support, we have a Patreon that you can sign up to for as little as a pound a month. But if you'd rather make a one-off donation, we also have a Ko-fi. You'll find all the relevant links in the description. Please ignore the irony of having to sell myself to make content! I also want to offer some content warnings in this video for things like depictions of gore, blood and violence, discussions of racism in part relating to how cyberpunk as a genre often fetishizes Asian aesthetics, and discussions of bodies and the uncomfortable ways in which they can be othered. I'd also like to offer a spoiler warning for the original Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Citizen Sleeper, Cyberpunk 2077, and Cyberpunk Edge Runners.
not every single game under the sun has some kind of representation of the body. In some puzzle games, for example, or in a game like Candy Crush, you don't move an avatar around, though it's always necessary to move your own physical body to play the game. A majority of games, though, require you to enter someone or something else's body, as playing as someone else, or even role-playing as your own character, is a good conduit for storytelling. I think one of the major problems that games have, or perhaps more specifically AAA games, is that there's meant to be this universal idea of what a body is. I'm sure I don't need to detail the earlier history of games, which was listed with machismo, muscles and polygonal breasts, all traits which play into male power fantasies and make an assumption about who the player is and what he desires. It's only more recently that we've seen a wider range of body types, but even in games with character creators we don't get to see many of the different kinds of bodies that exist. Matty Bryce even posits on her personal blog that the controller itself adds limits to how bodies can be presented in games, writing, Controllers in particular throttle the way bodies can be recognised in the design, and is probably the main agent in the absence of body subjectivity in critique. It is impossible to know how another's bodily reaction will be to an experience, and that exactitude is only necessary for products that promise it. She also notes how the lack of awareness of bodies assumes a typical body, most definitely excluding those who don't have it and their experiences, and further on, there is a distinct lack of internalisation, digestion and reflection baked into these experiences. Unless you are, you know, to be that person, a white cis man, even still in the year 2023, you can be hard pressed to find a body that looks like yours. Hell, I'm one of those things, white, and most would think I'm male too, but my fatness prevents me from seeing myself in most games, other than the case of evil characters or eldritch horrors like those seen in Bloodborne, but that's a video for another time. This severe lack of variation in bodies, from both an aesthetic and design perspective, is represented across the full board of genres. Though when you start to look to games which represent the future, things do start to change a bit. Cyberpunk as a genre, or even just media that is generally set in the future, often allows presentations of people, and therefore bodies, that aren't currently possible. In fact, a lot of media in the cyberpunk genre, and in sci-fi in general, is concerned with transcending the body, something which we can unpack a bit as we go along. A great recent example of this is Armored Core 6, Fires of Rubicon, a game that sees consciousness separated from the body in the form of its mysterious coral, yet intrinsically tied to giant metal bodies that have no other purpose but war. Both Autumn Wright and Karl Hauptner write excellently about the game's themes of post-humanism for bullet points and no escape respectively. But if we're to talk about the future and cyberpunk more specifically in depth, then I guess we're going to have to start by talking about capital C Cyberpunk. For better or worse, if you're someone that would mistakenly label themselves as a gamer, when you hear the word cyberpunk you're likely to think of CD Projekt Red's Cyberpunk 2077 before you do the genre these days. It's the first thing that comes up when you just google the word cyberpunk, even before the tabletop RPG the video game is based on, a point that just adds to the long list of reasons I consider the overbearing search engine my mortal enemy. Because of that, there's then a risk that cyberpunk 2077 is the default, the piece of media that going forward will be the one that defines how we perceive the genre. With that in mind, if this is the contemporary way most people will experience cyberpunk, we need to interrogate. How does it present its world? And more importantly, the people in it and how they move their bodies within this world. Before you even get a chance to see Night City, you're presented with your very first task, deciding how you look. It's a weighty mission, you're setting the tone for yourself for the rest of the game after all, even if you can change how you look later. If you've never played the game before, especially if you aren't familiar with the series lore, you have no way of knowing how the kind of body you occupy might affect the way you move in the world, so maybe you just want to look cool. Totally understandable, let's go. There are quite a few options at your disposal. As is par for the course with a lot of character creators, you can choose things like your skin tone, body type, hair, and even voice. I'm V. I'm V. You have some amount of flexibility, but there are immediately obvious limitations, as well as some that aren't so obvious. For one, there is again the topic of fatness. Once you eventually get to walk around Night City, you will find that fat people exist even 50 years from now, but for some reason it's an impossibility that V could be fat. Cyberpunk 2077 is a game that leans heavily into the world of transhumanism, this idea that the body can leave behind some of its limitations through the power of technology. We see this displayed frequently throughout the game's runtime, with characters that move at superhuman speeds, fight with arms that have the strength of a gorilla's, even abandoning whole parts of their flesh in favour of metal and electricity. Yet it can't seem to imagine that making all of these changes to your body could still be possible while having a fat body. This raises an important question, right? Not only about what bodies are desirable, but whether a human body, imperfect or modified, is desirable at all. Fine, I can't reflect the body that I have in the game I'm playing, I'm pretty used to that by now. What about my gender then? The simple explanation I give to most people about my gender is that I'm non-binary, a fairly non-committal thing to say given that there's no strict definition of what that means but for the most part it feels accurate. If I'm to dig deeper, the thing that feels like it makes the most sensible is that I'm an amorphous blob, 
but to the cis mind that one could be harder to understand, so I mostly save that for my fellow genderqueer people. In both cases though, I am once again unable to really explore that aspect of myself. Sure, you can somewhat pretend you're heading into Woolworths to root through the pick -a mix to create your character, but there's only so much you can fit in the tub. By that I mean, your options for gender are limited. You can have a penis, a vagina, and breasts in any combination, and you have two voices to choose from. Emma Kostopoulos does argue for side quests that the options presented to you does allow you to opt to be agender if you so choose writing. In other character creators I've used, there's no genitalia selection, but the gender selection implicitly brings with it an understanding that your character has a specific set of junk. By presenting us with a rolodex of penises, a vulva, and an explicit no thank you option, 2077 lets me make the conscious choice to play as an agender character in a way no other game has before. But the thing is, gender isn't just about our identity or how we feel. Gender is about a system of power. It's about how we're perceived, how our bodies are read by others, and therefore how we move through the world. In Cyberpunk, you can make your character look how you like, and when you're in the character creator, it might be fun and even gender euphoric. But then, you have to move that body within the world of Cyberpunk. The game creates a system through which characters read and interpret your gender. In order to experience certain romantic relationships, if you so choose to, you must have specific combinations of voice, body type, and genitalia, which is the least obvious part of the character creator. Characters you later meet like Judy Alvarez require you to have a feminine voice and feminine body, whatever that might mean, something that feels deeply opposed to the inherently queer relationship you can have with her. You can eventually have sex with Judy, regardless of genitalia, but that calls into question how much thought was put into the differences in how you can have sex depending on the body you have. Knowing how games are made, I can see that it's entirely possible it was just cheaper to have one cutscene. But Sarah asks me to note this is one of the few games, almost certainly the only AAA game, that arguably on paper represents trans lesbian sex, and there are a few ways you can tell this is lesbian sex written by cis het men. Sarah likes the Judy relationship a lot, but their immersion in the sex scene is broken by the mere fact that Judy has no body hair. Considering the scarcity and the importance of trans lesbian representation is unfortunate. Lesbians and lesbian sex are incredibly diverse, and this is a disservice. I knew all of this going into the game because I played it almost three years past release, so when I was playing I had more to think about when making my choices regarding the body I wanted to inhabit. I was making the choice about what body to inhabit with context, with an understanding of how I might or might not be able to move that body and relate to others with that body. I opted for the more feminine V, heavy emphasis on the quotation marks there, because these days going for the more femme option in games feels closer to how I want to represent myself. With a combination of these issues, as well as a number of problems I had with how the game was written, V never really felt like me, nor even partially like me. Throughout my playthrough I often felt frustrated by that fact, especially in a game that is meant to be, or at least I thought was meant to be, an RPG. I will admit that part of my problem likely comes from the fact that V is voice acted. People had similar problems with Fallout 4, which introduced player character voice acting, something Bethesda has now gone back on in Starfield. Marketing comes into play too that there seems to be a bit of a contradiction in some of the ways CD Projekt Red advertised cyberpunk. On the one hand, we have TV spots with Keanu Reeves where he says, the only limit to what you can do is what you're willing to become. To me personally, that certainly suggests a large amount of freedom, and that particular spot is literally called No Limits. But in the descriptions of certain videos, which I admit not many people will read, the game is only described as an open world action adventure title, no mention of it being a role playing game. If you go back to the game's gameplay reveal trailer from 2018, it is referred to as an RPG. But past that point you won't really find any of the trailers doing so. They'll highlight the fact that you can make many choices across its branching narratives, how varied the combat is, and how you can customise exactly how you look, all traits of RPGs, but they never use the word. So maybe I'm the one that made the mistake in thinking I get to be my own V, as at a certain point it seems like CD Projekt Red made the call to not truly advertise it as an RPG. Whether that fact has anything to do with how V is written I couldn't say, but I do wonder how it might have felt if the game leaned more into its tabletop origins when it came to character roleplay. There is also the chance that V not feeling like me, or my version of V, is on purpose. Early on in the game you'll find someone else joining you in your body, the legendary Johnny Silverhand, played by the aforementioned Reeves, a so-called terrorist rocker boy that cares about no one and nothing but himself and his cause. A short way into the game, Johnny's consciousness ends up in V's body, as a result of her putting a special chip in her head that has Johnny's personality on it. After a gunshot to the head that doesn't end up killing V, Johnny regains his sense of self. In turn, the main conflict between V and Johnny is who gets ownership over the body, something that becomes a pivotal decision at the end of the game. This conflict is a difficult process for V, as it's quite literally killing her as Johnny's consciousness slowly overwrites hers. You can quite easily see a balance of metaphorical and actual presentation of chronic illness at play here. V is literally fighting for her own body, despite the fact it's hurting her for reasons beyond her control. There are some powerful critiques of the way disabled people are treated by the non-disabled, in particular how medical professionals or repodocs in the case of cyberpunk treat them. 
Steph Farnsworth and Multiplay writes that V is treated with curiosity from Ripperdox. People touch and grab V to look into their eyes to see Johnny without their consent, not dissimilar to when strangers may command control of a wheelchair. And we'll talk about V for the medical and technological marvel taking place in their body without any concern for how they are. V then is stripped of any humanity. Wheelchair users being treated as inanimate objects is not an uncommon thing. There's an intrinsic power balance between wheelchair users and non-disabled people as those that don't rely on any kind of mobility aid can't understand what it's like to have your bodily autonomy removed at a moment's notice in this particular way. Similarly, with the introduction of Johnny into V's body, her autonomy too is removed. As Farnsworth points out in their essay, there are parts of the game where Johnny is able to take over the body completely, which they note that the unique thing about Cyberpunk's approach is that there are no metaphors for disability in V's story, but a literal exploration of managing deteriorating health. This is where things get slightly muddled for me, as I think the design aspects of V's battle for her body struggle don't entirely work. It is interesting to see how the game presents Johnny taking over V's body by literally letting us play as him in her body, but it being so scripted is where I feel the metaphor struck actual representation falls flat. I'm not arguing for the gamification of chronic illness or disability, but by limiting the moments V experiences pain through her illness, there's an implication that most of the time it's completely manageable. There are many issues with the medical system not treating those with chronic illnesses with the care they deserve, through dismissive comments that wave away how much pain a person is actually going through. If we view the moments that V is so overwhelmed with pain that she is unable to function as akin to chronic pain flare-ups, then only showing these in scripted moments suggests chronic illnesses aren't something that those with one have to live with 24-7. It's a frustrating element that undermines some of the more emotive scenes, as you do grow to care for V's well-being in the 30 or so hours you spend with her. Perhaps there's a tension here with the presumed player of Cyberpunk and their presumed desire, a tension between creating a game to pander to a power fantasy or being able to go anywhere and do anything, and a narrative which depicts a character with lofty goals who becomes terminally ill, a character who has to move their disabled body, their gendered body, through a particular context. Again, I'm not necessarily saying we should gamify chronic illness, but there is a tension between Cyberpunk's narrative and gameplay in terms of its representation of bodies. A representation which with different gameplay and narrative design choices could powerfully explore the limits of bodies. Instead, we get a push and pull between a game that wants to empower your body and to limit it at the same time. These are some of the tensions that arise from a transhumanist approach too. When we long to transcend our bodies, is it because of the inherent limitations of them, or is it because of how difficult it is to move them through worlds? On that note, I do think that this is something another lowercase c cyberpunk game does to a powerful effect. Citizen Sleeper. Much like Cyberpunk 2077, Citizen Sleeper takes after tabletop RPGs, though it embodies the mechanics of them a whole lot more than Cyberpunk does. But despite that, unlike many TTRPGs, you don't get to decide an awful lot about your character before you start playing. In fact, you can only make one choice, which class you are. There are three to choose from, Extractor, Machinist or Operator, all of which have their own starting stats which mostly affect the early game. Your body though is preordained. You are a sleeper, a digital, but still human, consciousness placed inside a robotic body that is devoid of any hint of gender, race or otherwise though, because gender, race and so forth are again a question of the worlds we occupy and how much we move through them, there are questions if such descriptors work the same in the game's world as they do in ours, which we'll unpack later. In the world of Citizen Sleeper, sleepers are an other people, viewed as less than because they are perceived to not be real people, a fairly classic idea surrounding humanoid robots. It's a harsh world you quickly discover as you play. One where people give little shits about you or where you come from, but occasionally enough of a shit to find your presence a negative, or even positive one. It's made harsher still by the fact that your body is in a constant state of failing. You're on the run, you see, from a corporation that quite literally owns you and even provides you with a sort of medicine that keeps you alive. Of course, this corporation is the only place that produces it, legally speaking, so escape from said corporation is a near guaranteed death sentence. In turn, you have to become resourceful. You can somewhat repair your body using scrap you find across the eye, a large ring that homes all manner of peoples. But if you're lucky, you can find that medicine or stabilizer to get yourself back to peak health. This ties very neatly in your ability to perform. Every cycle, a measurement of time that isn't exactly clear but somewhat functions as the days of the week, you get a fresh set of dice that ranges from 1 to 6. You don't get a 6 sided die though, just the individual numbers, each of which increase your chances of successfully performing any given action. If you find your body to be in poor health, you subsequently have less die at your disposal. Your body, therefore, is mechanical in a literal and figurative sense, and it's fighting against you at every step of the way. This is where Cyberpunk and Citizen Sleeper differ in their presentation of bodies and of disability. In Cyberpunk, your post-human body is able to be modified to some superhuman extremes, which doesn't necessarily have a cost to V's health, and as discussed is a bit jarring with the game's narrative. Perhaps it's helpful here to start thinking of the social versus medical models of disability. 
We've discussed this in other videos, but in a nutshell, are you disabled because of your body or because of society? Is it something else or is it both? Sits and Sleeper arguably takes the idea of posthuman even further, as its sleepers retain consciousness but lose their biological form. Their bodies can't be changed or improved because the game's world isn't built that way. If you're a sleeper, that's your lot in life. You best make the most of it. Despite not having a body of flesh, that doesn't mean you're incapable of experiencing various aspects of human senses, both physically and mentally. As Renata Price wrote in their review of the game, Citizen Sleeper is grounded in the sensory experience of the sleeper above all else. It is all taste and smell and other senses that those of us in bodies made of flesh and bone have no reference for. You can eat, but more importantly, you can taste. Sleep, but more critically rest, feel pain, but most essentially of all, comfort. Citizen Sleeper doesn't give you a choice in the body you have, but it's not devoid of the qualities that make a body a body. So, much like in the real world, you make do with the body you have, through all of the bad and good parts of it, something I can heavily relate to in my own fat body, which has its own set of benefits, soft, cuddly, and drawbacks, harassment, clothing options. There are obvious parallels with disability as a whole here too, again, towards those with chronic illnesses. Danny Ray of Overland quite rightly ties the game's central mechanic, your dice, with spoon theory, a way of explaining that having a chronic illness is like knowing you have a certain amount of spoons you can use each day, which often isn't as many as other people have access to. At one point within the game, a nest of data is described as moving like a loop with no end, writes Ray, continuing on to say that this is what you begin to feel like as you end cycle after cycle, body deteriorating, having to choose between acting toward a goal or the endless drudgery of feeding yourself, charging your body in sunlight, fixing it with scrap, earning currency, clout, friendships, and information to purchase stabilizer to slow the inevitable deterioration of yourself. That is your entire goal after all, at least at first, stopping yourself from dying. These goals can change as you progress, though, as you get to know others to live on the eye, but I'll get to that later. Ostensibly, Citizen Sleeper is a game about trying to figure out how you can best inhabit the body you've been provided. When I explained that you're a digital human consciousness, I made sure to mention the human part, as what you are is a copy of someone else's consciousness. Your consciousness was sold off by your original body, the reason presumably being for monetary gain, but that exchange is something we'll again get back to later. What your consciousness is then left with is a body that was created by someone else and therefore isn't technically yours? That doesn't matter much though, as throughout your time in the eye, you stake your claim on your body by making your own decisions on how you want to exist and the people you want to spend time with. Being an RPG, you make all of these choices yourself, but interestingly enough, you will find incredibly similar themes in the seminal work that is Final Fantasy VII Remake. Much like the previous two games I've been discussing so far, Final Fantasy VII is an RPG, but that doesn't mean it expresses the idea of roleplay in exactly the same way. For one, where Citizen Sleeper and Cyberpunk have you making choices about what your body can do or how your body looks, FF7 has no such choices. In fact, it doesn't feature any kind of choice at all, from the very start to the very end. Or at least not any choice that makes any significant changes to its main plot beats. That's pretty typical of RPGs from Japan. They often have characters that have their own voices and stories, and while you used to be able to change their names, for the most part there is a set main path you follow, with the occasional divergence in the form of side quests and minigames. It's interesting then that despite you not being able to make any kind of choice about your body, or should I say pretty boy Cloud's body, that it has so much to say about bodies as a whole. Cloud, for those who just know him by his fluffy hair and deep blue eyes, is what is known as a soldier, that word being entirely capitalized and not your typical idea of what a soldier, lowercase is. I won't bore you with the finicky, slightly complicated lore details as to how soldiers come to be, but the important thing you need to know is that they are superhumans, created by fusing their bodies with Mako, a substance which acts as the very life force of the planet. And this is all carried out by the corporation stripped de facto government known as Shinra, who also just now happen to be the main enemy of the game, at least to start. In turn, these members of Soldier gain heightened reflexes, strength, and sense, as well as a stronger connection with the materia, glass looking orbs that are FF7's way of presenting magic. Cloud is specifically Soldier, first class, the most elite of all soldiers, ranking him amongst the best of the best though he will regularly remind you that he is now ex-soldier. How he came to be first class is more complicated than other members of soldier, and isn't completely relevant for today's topic of discussion, but there is one thing that is certain about him. His body is not like others. Those deep blue eyes of him aren't natural, they're actually evidence of his changed state of being, a side effect of being infused with Marco, something that's even pointed out in the game itself. It's a clear signifier that his body isn't like others, though there are questions of where his body might be positioned in the lens of our own socio-political context. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but its prequel game Crisis Core very much grapples with the potential negatives that come from having your body altered in such a way, with some of the main characters quite literally becoming monstrous as a result of it, to varying degrees. 
You can check out Sarah's video on Vampire for more on the role of monsters and power in video games, and you should keep your eyes peeled for more videos on the subject from us in the future. I don't have time to dig into Crisis Core today, but one thing I want to make a point of is that I don't think Remake's presentation of Cloud views him as what one might call a monster, through his physical form or his actions. Deep Hell Skeleton wrote quite lovingly about Cloud for their own website, on the topic of gender and having your body represented on screen. It surprised me to see that Square Enix went so strongly against a tradition of perfect gorgeous characters. In this return to the Ur Sword Boy, it's different. Cloud is strong but not stiff, defined but not grotesque. I can't say if his body is realistic. Nothing that aspire to realism can be so if it's made by a dozen different hands trying to craft an image worth selling. I almost believe he could swing that sword now. I want to believe it, because I want it to be true for myself. Cloud's body, then, is potentially a symbol of strength, one that can help others and maybe save the world? Remake, the first entry in the now-planned trilogy, hasn't quite arrived at its world-ending stakes yet, but it still tasks you with saving parts of the world, quite specifically the fictional city of Midgar, a steampunk ex-cyberpunk locale that quite literally features a physical class divide. Up top, above the plates, live the economically comfortable, their specific class designation hard to determine, but compared to the slums below, it's safe to say they aren't exactly working class. Remake shows us a literal separation of bodies then, some of which are deemed metaphorically and literally below the bodies of the elite. That isn't to say the game is in favour of such an ideal. Cloud might be this grumpy mercenary who acts like he cares about nothing but filling his pockets with enough money to live. But that's not really who he is, in more ways than one. Having the body that he does, he's put to work, assign the tasks the elderly, young, sick and poor are unable to. Sometimes that means fending off monsters, other times that means rounding up cats, but all of it has value to the people who have limits to what their bodies allow them to do. Cloud isn't better for having such a supposedly strong body, it's just that he's the only one who can do these things, because, well, he's the protagonist, so of course he is. It's through these actions that he discovers how he can take back his body that was stolen from him by Shinra, and turn it into a vessel for good as opposed to corporate greed. When we contrast to our other games and their representations of transhumanism, we might argue here that having an augmented body might be positive, not for selfish or individualistic reasons, but because you can enable, help, and support others with disabled or classed bodies, or bodies that are limited in some way, as all human bodies are. This might give us food for thought on the more grounded real-world position of being a carer. Equally, we might still see this fitting into an individualistic power, or more specifically, saviour fantasy. Cloud individually cannot save everyone with his augmented body, which is the recurring issue with transhumanism. One individual's transcendence, the limitations of the human body, doesn't address the political or social context which impose limits on our bodies. Yes, some of our body's limits are inherent to our bodies, but many are structural. The idea of corporate greed is something that deeply ties into our other two games as well, and helps us begin to address this question of the structural issues more deeply. The main thing that gives context to each game's presentation of the body is that mysterious and simultaneously all too material force. Capital. I don't think most games, at the very least AAA ones, are very good at critiquing capitalist structures and systems. How can they, when the games themselves are a product that a multi-million dollar company is trying to sell you, sometimes more than once through remakes and remasters, occasionally forever if it's a live service game? Because of that very fact, I think there's only so far an anti-capitalist message can go, as it will all feel like a lie or at least hypocritical. With Cyberpunk 2077's transition from tabletop to video game, I definitely think some of its more radical politics were muddied though it's not like the original tabletop game is perfect in its presentation of various cultures in the future. Cyberpunk as a genre, and Cyberpunk as a tabletop RPG have long distinctly offered criticisms of capitalism and everything it encompasses. The tabletop RPG features a world where mega corporations have taken hold of the world following a major economic collapse in the US, though obviously it recovers, with the powerhouse that is Japan also stepping in to exert its own control. I'll talk about this more later, but you might already be raising your eyebrows here at a clear example of so-called yellow peril the racist fear of East and Southeast Asian people taking over the Western world. This law extends to 2077, which is set a good ways further along chronologically than any of the editions of the tabletop RPG so far. In 2077, you also have the option of starting your playthrough in the Corpo world with you, the player, arriving in Night City at a time of supposed stability compared to its history. This is the playthrough I opted for as I wanted to see how CD Projekt Red handled a V that has such a history. Specifically, you work for Arasaka, a Japanese corporation, but soon enough you're kicked out and essentially left to rot. 
You turn towards mercenary work, something that's unfamiliar to Corpo V at first, but she has to make a living somehow. Where I expected her Corpo history to be tightly woven into the game's main story, what I found was just a few exclusive dialogue options that did occasionally offer a little bit of insider knowledge, that another version of me might not have, but nothing revolutionary. Arasaka is an important part of the quest that unfolds upon you, but not so much in its role as a mega corporation. It's more a tale of personal revenge for Johnny, and one of survival for V. Arasaka is the corporation that represents capitalism at large, especially to Johnny. Why should this Japanese corporation be any more evil or representative of capitalism than, for example, the US corporation Militech? I think if Cyberpunk were a better written game, the theme of survival would be better connected to the world's anti-capitalist messaging. Yeah, V's whole thing is to take back ownership of her body due to Johnny's inadvertently slowly killing her, and she does suffer at the hands of Arasaka at the beginning of the corporate playthrough. But after that point, she never seems to have any kind of material economic problems. Work is tough, sure, she's constantly putting herself on the line alongside her compatriot Jackie Wells, but there's never any sign of her struggling to pay the bills. Florence Freya in a personal blog post accurately observes that there are clear parallels between 2077 and the real world. Right now, a quarter of Americans say they or a family member have delayed getting medical treatment due to costs. Material conditions are leading people to commit crimes, and the minimum wage is not high enough to sustain a person living alone. Yet we don't see V affected by any of these problems, or at least what we're told narratively again feels discordant or jarring with the material experience of playing the game. Through gameplay, you don't get the feeling that you are moving your body through the context, the world that the game's narrative is telling you about. She's a mug, and requires money to survive like any of us do. It's dangerous work that she has to engage in as well, obviously. So there is a technical risk there. It being a game though, there's no true risk to be found. Failed a mission? Don't worry about it, respawn a try again. There are some missions you can permanently fail, but in my experiences, this didn't seem to affect V's quality of life. The lack of in-game necessity for financial security makes me question why V needs to work at all. Cyberpunk does tell you why, the intro I chose shows her kicked out of Arasaka, forced into the mercenary life in order to survive. But it doesn't force the player to survive. It places V's struggle in a vacuum, separate from the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, only cropping up again when the plot demands it, which undermines the message that to exist in Night City when you're not at the top of the food chain is to struggle. Much like how gamifying something like chronic illness could be questionable depending on how it's handled, the same could be said of forcing the player to risk poverty if they don't engage in dangerous merc work. AAA games like Cyberpunk can be very risk averse these days, as obviously the developers want you to see their expensive set pieces they devote so much time to. So I understand why the game doesn't really make the player engage in merc work to survive, but it feels like a missed opportunity. Maybe a more systems driven game would handle things differently, really lean into how horrible this world is to live in. Think back to Citizen Sleeper, where depending on how well your health is doing, you have more or less dice at your disposal, and in turn, more or less physical and mental bandwidth to carry out certain tasks. You can see societal problems as you wander the streets of Night City, we can see those who don't have the luxury of modernity and fancy cyberware, but they're just a backdrop for the rest of the story. Arasaka becomes cartoonish as a result, evil simply because it's a corporation that wants to own your soul. This is quite literal, as Arasaka owns a piece of software called Soul Killer that can quite literally copy a person's consciousness, and is the reason as to why Johnny ends up in V's body. Critique of capitalism is limited by focusing on one corporation in this cartoonish way. And again we have to ask, why is Japanese Arasaka, not American Militech, the story's big bad? The game makes it obvious that Soul Killer is bad, and is a major part of why Johnny wants revenge on Arasaka, but at least in the ending I experienced, it doesn't encourage the player to engage in any ideas about dismantling any of the corporations that again, literally want to own you. If anything, being a financial supporter of these companies is encouraged, at least from a gameplay perspective. The various pieces of cyberware you can purchase will be from one of the game's various companies, whether it be Militech, Kang Tao, or Arasaka. It's almost necessary too, as the implants let you have superhuman abilities. Without them, the game becomes a lot more challenging, as most enemies in the game utilise the varying types of cyberware that can be acquired. This seems like a small detail, but it would be an interesting one for the game to engage with. In real life, we often have to navigate how capitalism has taken away our self-sufficiency, our ability to grow our own food for example, and manufactured a dependency on capitalist commodities. You have to buy produce from a supermarket instead. But it's worth thinking about boycotts and strikes as historically effective tools that we collectively use to fight capitalism, which cause real damage to companies and can tear down regimes, like in the case of apartheid South Africa. There is something to be said of a game that forces you to have a body that is a mixture of flesh and chrome. It certainly could suggest that in this hyper-capitalist, futuristic setting, the only way to get by is with money. I think there is also a potentially powerful idea that we can use these pieces of cyberware against our oppressors, though I don't think the game does enough to suggest this is the case. Mechanics being literally fun rather than thematically interesting will always be the priority, because the game itself is a product to make money before it is art. Many hands involved themselves in Cyberpunk as a product, something that is bound to happen in a game made by 500 people. Executives will forever interfere, even if, and sometimes especially if, it will make the product worse. As long as it makes money, right? 
Conversely, Citizen Sleeper doesn't have such a problem, being made by essentially just five people, with all the pros written by lead developer Gareth Damien Martin. Citizen Sleeper doesn't have a main story. There's kind of a path that you get directed towards at the start. But as mentioned, and much like V's aims, the ultimate goal is survival. Everything else is just happenstance. That makes it a potentially difficult game for some, but to me it makes the carefully crafted world all the more enticing. An interesting world alone doesn't make a story, or stories, compelling though. Luckily, Citizen Sleeper also has some excellently written characters, who are the main driving force of the various storylines you can experience in the game. There's Sabine, a doctor you meet early on that first supplies you with Stabilizer, who you later end up in a sticky situation with over some issues with a local crime organisation. You've also got Ethan, a freelance bounty hunter who's after none other than the very sleeper you play as, who loves to force you to pay for his bar tab every few cycles. And then, there's Lem and Mina. You first meet Lem, and subsequently Mina, at the local shipyard, where you're trying to find some work to uncryo the game's currency. As a sleeper, you're immediately distrustful at the very least Lem, not really able to offer much of a response in your dialogue options. As you continue to talk with Lem, you learn more and more about his and Mina's situation. Lem is working on a particular ship, the Side Real Horizon, a ship that feels akin to Noah's Ark. Not through any particular symbolism in the text, more so it serves as an escape to a better tomorrow, as that's quite literally what it will do. The main plan for the ship is to take its inhabitants to a new world, and theoretically a better tomorrow. Undeniably, there are some themes of colonialism at play here, with the ruling classes clearly uninterested in the possible negative effects of their search for a new home. There's questions to be asked about why those that live there don't try to work together to make the home they do have better. Obviously those in charge couldn't care less about such a thing, but what about workers coming together to enact collective change? Maybe we should be asking similar questions about people who want to leave the planet to die, and colonise the moon instead of working to make this planet a better place too. Whether Lem knows this or not is hard to say, but his priority is to get both him and Mina off the eye, and that promise of a better tomorrow is one that's crucial to their story. Over time, presuming you're making the right dialogue choices, you get quite close to Lem and Mina, occasionally even babysitting the latter, both you and Lem working on the side real horizon, with the promise that all three of you will receive a ticket at the end to board it, or at least the chance to do so. According to Lem, that promise involves arriving at a totally independent colony, no surrogacy, no corporations. It sounds almost too good to be true, sort of reminds us a lot of settler colonialism in our own world, the promises of a better life weaponized to encourage poor and marginalized folks to become settlers and the grim reality upon their arrival is to become part of a genocidal project. You get closer and closer with both Lem and Mina, and they honestly start to feel like family. Eventually you learn that Mina is technically adopted, if it can be called that, but nonetheless they are fan family, and it feels like you are too. A while after that, you achieve just what you set out to. Work on the ship completes, and you prepare yourselves to receive your tickets. Except of course things don't go the way you intended. The powers that be offer a fancy speech about how much they appreciate all of the hard work you've done, but don't have the common decency to tell you this in person. As this speech unfolds, and the draw begins, a spanner is thrown in the works. The draw depends on your identification number. You won't be surprised to hear that a majority of the workers do not have any such number, and neither do Lem, or Mina, or you. The whole thing was fixed, you're not getting off the eye, and neither are your friends. It is easily one of the most crushing things I've experienced in the game this last year. Made worse by the fact you're told you failed this particular part of the quest. There was nothing you could have done, and that's the whole point. The reason I spent the time outlining the main beats of this story is that it feels uncomfortably reflective of the world we live in. It's that classic thing of the workers putting in all of the effort, being the literal foundations of the product, whatever it might be, and reaping none of the benefits. And part of the reason that we work to generate profit for capital, or the powers that be, is because we are sold the myth of capitalist meritocracy, that those who work hard get ahead, which is a lie. This is slightly off the cuff because when I wrote this particular segment there were layoffs at Epic, including about 900 employees, a 16% reduction in staff, all because they spent too much too fast, but since then in the games industry there's been thousands more, including at massive companies like Microsoft. These are just some of the instances of the constant layoffs happening in this industry, one that claims to be the most financially successful out of all the forms of entertainment that exists. I think the storyline with Lemon Mina surmises much of what the game is about. Right from the get-go, you put it at a disadvantage because you were born in the wrong body, despite there being nothing wrong with your body. It's a world where you have none of the power and far too much of the responsibility, a theme that also feels quite prevalent in Final Fantasy VII Remake.
where cyberpunk is muddled in its presentation of capitalism and Citizen Sleeper is uncomfortably realistic, Remake is cartoonish by comparison. You can simply take a look at President Shinra, a man whose face is clearly designed to look stereotypically evil, complete with blonde hair and blue eyes. There's a lot of that in this game. Shinra is a company that is also essentially a local government, ruling over Midgard due to being the main supplier of Mako Energy, an energy source that is very literally pulling out the life force of the planet. It is incredibly ham-fisted now, much the same as it was when the original game was released in 1997. John Bale spoke of how the remake still retained some of its arguable flaws from the original for bullet points, writing, Final Fantasy VII Remake still skirts around the concept of capitalism itself, as an individual corporation stands in here for an entire abstract economic and political system. But, to the game's credit, Shinra manages to function pretty much as the entire system in Final Fantasy VII's fiction. It owns and runs everything, functioning in Midgar as a de facto state authority. Cartoonish as both the president of and Shinra itself might be, it doesn't mean there aren't some worthwhile criticisms being made. The leading voice of dissent against Shinra and Remake comes from Barrett, a character who genuinely has an incredibly compelling backstory that you experienced in the original game, and now in its sequel Rebirth, who is equally charismatic now in Remake. The biggest issue with him mostly comes from the fact that he's voiced as if he's Mr. T, a now incredibly culturally outdated reference point that at first glance might lead you to believe Barrett just serves the role of the stereotypically angry black man. That isn't the case though, as arguably he's the biggest force for change in Remake, as he is acutely aware of the evils of Shinra, as well as the fact that they're slowly killing the planet for the sake of profit. He is also a disabled character, one of his arms replaced by a mini Gatling gun, the original loss of which was again a result of Shinra's corporate greed. It's worth pausing here again to reflect on the use of the word disabled. Is Barrett disabled because he is an amputee? Or because the world of Final Fantasy VII is inaccessible for amputees? Or systematically oppresses amputees? Barrett, like many other video game characters with prosthetic limbs, is not only enabled by science fiction level mobility aids, but elevated to the level of trans or posthumanist status of cyborg. Is it perhaps ironic that in a game about climate disaster, which does quite a good job of connecting climate disaster to capitalist overconsumption, you have a character with a cool prosthetic limb which doubles up as a weapon, when the arms industry is one of the leading contributors to climate disaster by a long shot? What are his embodied and material experiences as a disabled man, especially in contrast with our protagonists in Cyberpunk and Citizen Sleeper? We'll let that question linger for now, but perhaps that's a topic worth exploring when we see more of his backstory in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, a sequel we'll hopefully come back to here at Game Assist. When it comes to the fight against Shinra, there's personal stakes here for Barrett, emboldened by the looming threat of climate disaster, and he cares deeply for those that live in the slums beneath the great pizza in the sky. That point about climate disaster is deeply tied to Remake's themes, as well as the original games, as they both quite literally place the blame of the planet's inevitable destruction on Shinra, i.e. a corporation that only wants to obtain more and more power and wealth, and doesn't care in the slightest how that might affect the planet. Sounds familiar to our own world, doesn't it? Yes, capitalism is the problem, and banning plastic straws won't fix it, and no, I don't really want to think about how a game that's almost 30 years old still has themes relevant to today. This does lead Barrett to a life of eco-terrorism, again, heavy emphasis on the quotes here, blowing up power plants as part of an organisation called Avalanche, though he's formed his own sect of it, deemed too extremist by the others. To be clear here though, Avalanche doesn't position itself as a terrorist group, that designation is placed upon it by Shinra. Much like the game's themes on climate disaster, you can too see parallels here with how revolutionary groups can be labelled as terrorists all in the name of propaganda. Meaning, it's a buzzword that to most people will automatically mean the bad guys, and encouraging those same people to not think further about what it is those groups actually want. It also feels significant, of course, that Barrett as a racialized man is the most committed so-called terrorist of the bunch. Tifa, another member of the group, who feels the most amount of guilt about their actions, questions whether the normal people that work for Shinra deserve the stress they too are experiencing. And in turn, Barrett delivers an incredible line. A good man who serves a great evil is not without sin. He must recognize and accept his complicity. He must open his eyes to the truth that his corporate masters are profiting from the planet's pain. Only then can he redeem himself. I know you know this. I do. It's a stark acknowledgement of the systems at play that can pressure people who are oppressed themselves into complicity in oppressive systems. Sure, working for Shinra or Google or any other conglomerate that has far too much power for its own good doesn't mean you're inherently evil, but it's still worth reflecting on whether the position that you're in there is contributing towards making the world worse. Ultimately, the game's actual commentary on capitalism itself mostly extends to, it's bad, right? With the themes of environmentalism being most prevalent. But capitalism and climate disaster are intrinsically linked, a legacy of colonizing the world and building capitalist systems to overconsume, exploit, and destroy the environment has led us here. So any knock on how a corporation handles environmental issues is a knock on capitalism itself. Remake is also extremely notably a remake, one that divests from the path laid out before it by the original game in ways that are yet to become fully clear. The final round of bosses in the game might be mostly metaphorical and somewhat metaphysical, but the thing that Cloud & Co are fighting for is tomorrow. Not even necessarily a better one, 
but just making sure that tomorrow exists. It's a fight against fate itself, and while that might feel dramatic when applied to the real world, our own real world stakes are incredibly high, so maybe we need a bit more of the dramatic. Fighting against the broad concept of capitalism and the world itself requires an exchange though, one that might first require to give part of yourself or your body for the benefit of someone else. The idea of exchanging the body for capital can hold a lot of different meanings. At its most basic form, it can be the mere fact of having to do capitalist work for a wage which you exchange for the things you need to survive – housing, food, water, and so on. The system makes it incredibly hard to be self-sufficient – to grow your own food or build your own house unless you're rich, so you have little choice. Further to that, it can mean working too much at the expense of your own health, or others reaping the benefits. But it can also be about things like changing your body in order to do waged work. For example, how black women might have to change their hair to look more professional, an obviously racist idea, or even sports professionals pushing their bodies in ways that quite literally changes the shape of them. I think that last point on changing the body is actually best represented in Cyberpunk Edge Runners, Studio Trigger's take on the world of Cyberpunk released in 2022. It follows the initially quite bland David, a character who doesn't have much to offer the world, and who loses everything in a shooting. His life is somewhat similar to V's in that regard, especially in my playthrough, as when we meet him, he's attending a school that should eventually lead him towards a corpo life at Arasaka. After the shooting where he loses his mother, he discovers his mother was in possession of some Sandivist and cyberware, which if you've played the game, you know essentially lets you move as if everything else is in slow motion. Following this, he joins a crew of Edge Runners, a crew his mother secretly had connections to where he of course slowly bonds with each member. Over time, his body changes more and more, with David very quickly bulking up thanks to these changes. These physical changes in turn lead to growth in his economic status, allowing him to move out of his crummy flat into a luxury apartment that looks over the rest of Night City. The problem for David is that all of these changes lead him to experience worse and worse cyberpsychosis, an in-world condition that sees the organic parts of the body struggle to reckon with the technological. Unlike the elites who made their money through the exploitation of others, David made his by changing his body in a way that clearly wasn't healthy for him. In turn, his destiny is set in stone, and his fate leads him to a destructive and upsetting end, calling into question how worthwhile that exchange was. Yes, David had accumulated wealth and in turn power, no longer having to struggle to survive, but that didn't lead him towards a better life ultimately. These are themes I would have liked to have seen explored more in the game itself, but that doesn't mean Cyberpunk 2077 has nothing interesting to see. I mentioned sex earlier, because it's quite an important part of Cyberpunk's world. Daz goes more into this in their essay covering gender-based violence, exploitation, and sex workers' rights in video games. Sex is everywhere in Night City, from the advertising that's plastered absolutely everywhere to, yes, the sex industry unsurprisingly. This is Cyberpunk we're talking about though, so sex work works differently. So-called dolls use specific chips that allow their clients to have whatever kind of experience they want, leaving the sex workers themselves absent of the memory of the experience itself. The sex worker literally leaves their body or allows their body to be taken over in order to work, in order to survive. It's a stark representation of emotional labour, that famous idea theorised by Arlie Russell Hochschild about how workers must manage or perform emotions when they work. Therefore, they aren't just doing physical labour but emotional labour too, like when a service worker is always supposed to smile. I don't think Cyberpunk confronts this all that well. At one point during the game, during one of its main quests, you end up booking a session with a doll in order to acquire information you need. Except, the doll is there to work, and so they talk with you as you figure out your problems in life. I don't know if I'd go as far to say that V trauma dumps here, but they are using the doll, even if accidentally, to move towards emotional closure. We see this often in real life. Sex is of course something that brings up a lot for people. It can be a deeply embodied and emotional thing. But whether harm is intended or not, many people who employ sex workers expect emotional labour from them too, even though this isn't technically part of the sex worker's job. In Cyberpunk, at the end of the session with the doll, the chip that allows them to carry out their work becomes inactive, their consciousness restored. V in turn starts to press the doll for information they need, their language more violent than it was before. You can even threaten violence too. It felt like quite a gross moment to me, and soured me on V slightly. I spoke earlier of how V never really felt like me, and this moment in particular solidified that distance between me and her. Overall, unlike a game like Grand Theft Auto for example, Cyberpunk doesn't just have sex workers as objects to satiate the presumably insatiably horny players out there. Sex work is an important part of the story, and at least sex workers appear as a complex important character. One of the earliest characters you meet in the game, Evelyn Parker, is a doll, and is someone that eventually leads you on to meet Judy. Subsequently, through Judy, you also experience one of the game's best side quests, which again directly involves sex work and sex workers. This is another point of dissonance for Cyberpunk though as at the same time there are male and female joy toys that do operate more like sexual objects for the player, devoid of character, even if it isn't as bad as GTA. 
Unfortunately, partway through the game, Evelyn dies, very specifically as a victim of people who feel very little sympathy for dolls. Judy, being a very close friend of hers, is understandably upset, and leads her on a very justified path of revenge. Evelyn worked as a doll at a club called Clouds, where Judy herself used to work as a brain dance technician, brain dancers being a form of technology that allows you to record and play back someone else's experiences, from sight to touch to emotions. Clouds, though, is run by one of the game's gangs, the Tiger Claws, who ultimately don't care about the welfare of the dolls there, instead approaching them as objects to be exploited for profit, which is part of the reason why Evelyn was so horrifically abused. And so, after slowly uncovering more and more of what happened to Evelyn, Judy actually recruits some of the dolls to take over the club, eventually resulting in you killing the member of the Tiger Claws that owns Clouds, theoretically putting the power into the hands of the dolls. We did it, girls, we seized the means of production. If you do end up in this route as I did, things don't end happily, though. The Tiger Claws take revenge on some of the dolls by killing them, temporarily closing down the club. It's upsetting, and does obviously lead Judy to question whether she did the right thing or not. Frustratingly, the game never really answers that question, as the alternative option is a former flame of Judy's taking over the club, but nothing really changing for the better. I do think conceptually there is a potentially revolutionary idea in there. It's a pretty classic case of putting the means of production in the hands of those that do the work. I just wish that Cyberpunk wasn't so insistent on being a constantly pessimistic world, even if that is technically meant to be the point. Conversely, despite presenting the titular sleeper in a world that hates it, Citizen Sleeper isn't all that defeatist. In fact, it's quite the opposite, as while at first you might see a world that constantly tries to beat down those just trying to make a living, there's a strong sense of community and hope that makes the daily grind feel more worth it. The community present on the eye is an interesting one, because it's made up of such a varied cast of characters. Quickly you'll notice though that there's something in common with a number of the friends that you come to make. Many of those suffering at the hands of the elite are, through the lens of our own world, racialized. Okay, let's hang on a minute and remember what racialization is. It's a social process based on the idea that people's physical features mark them out as part of different races. Colonialism and capitalism have used this tool, which developed from the era of European colonization and developed into race science to mark out populations for enslaving, colonizing, and exploiting. Racialization is therefore different across history and place. Someone might be red as black here, but not there. Someone might have been racialized 100 years ago, but is now more assimilated into whiteness. We've talked about this in other videos, particularly our video on settler colonialism and indigeneity, but basically, when it comes to reading race in fantasy worlds, we are reading structures and social processes. We aren't reading things like skin colour or hair type in and of themselves, we are looking out for whether or not they mean anything and what they might mean in these fantasy worlds. Because it's not plainly stated, there's no indication as to what cultural background or ethnicity any of your companions might have or be. But in this far future, I think the more important thing is that they appear to be racialized through markers we would recognize in our own world, like skin tones. I say appear to be because race is never defined as a thing that exists in Citizen Sleeper. There's no character or bit of lore that explains its world as a post-racial one, or if there's a different system of race, like in fantasy worlds where skin colour isn't a racial marker but pointy elf ears are, nor do we ever have a character say where they're from or whether that is significant. So there is the question of how race fits into Citizen Sleeper's world and story. Of course, like all art, it's impossible to make a game without some semblance of the creator's experience of the world seeping into its messaging. Citizen Sleeper quite clearly has large amounts of class commentary throughout its story, and it's impossible to separate class from race so I would hope that the game's various characters being racialized isn't incidental, though maybe I'm being too generous to assume that would be the case. Characters like Ethan, the bounty hunter I mentioned earlier, and Hardin, both white, sit not necessarily the highest on the food chain, but higher than most. This isn't to say there aren't people of color in comfortable positions in the game, but they don't have any kind of overwhelming power over the comings and goings of the eye. Sometimes people will counter the idea that racism exists by pointing to wealthy or powerful people like Rishi Sunak or Obama but colonialism and racism have always operated by ingratiating some racialized people into the system, like how British India couldn't have functioned without the British reinforcing the existence of the caste system, and encouraging upper caste Indians to be tools of British rule. Lem too appears to be racialized through the lens of our world by his skin tone, and considering he's our representative of the average shipyard worker, it feels safe to assume that many others, who we never get to see due to the game's limited use of artwork, are so too. We've said that part of how race works is to create global classes to exploit, just take the Windrush generation as an example. In the first place, Britain colonized the Caribbean to steal natural resources, and the history of the region is shaped by European colonizers sending slaves and indentured laborers from Africa and India there to work in horrific conditions to grow the empire's wealth. Then, in the 1950s and 60s, swaths of Caribbean people, victims of colonization taught to internalize the white supremacist idea of the UK as a motherland and a better place, were invited to the UK in order to fulfill post-war labor shortages. When they got here, they were only to be met with vitriol, and as discovered in 2018, in some cases wrongful detainment at best, deportation at worst. It feels like an appropriate parallel to the work that Lem and your sleeper do, quite literally working on a ship but never feeling the full extent of the benefits. Sure, you can sweat tirelessly day after day, barely able to look after your daughter without help, 
but if you aren't born in the right body, you won't be able to get the same returns as your white counterparts. Citizen Sleeper doesn't view the body as solely something to be traded for a better life though. Its most revolutionary ideals come into the form of community, something that your sleeper forms with both Lem as well as others. If you continue down the right path by working around the systems in place, you are able to eventually get Lemamine off of the eye, even yourself, though I had more I wanted to see so I stayed behind. It's interesting that the only way to get Lemon Mean a ticket to, hopefully, freedom is through illegal means, but they certainly aren't immoral ones. There's a suggestion there that perhaps the capitalist ideas of hard work and perseverance can get you anywhere are, uh, uh, bullshit actually? Something that feels quite powerful, especially in light of the wave of layoffs I mentioned earlier. Citizen Sleeper, while presenting a tough and harsh world, understands that big capitalist ambitions aren't the thing to search for in life. I think this is also quite well exemplified by a questline with a character called Emphis, again, a racialized character, being dark skinned. One who is a chef that deals in both food and stories. When you first meet him, he's more interested in you than he is in any kind of payment. Over time, you come to supply him with ingredients, mushrooms to be specific, and form a very particular bond with him. He's not exactly a close friend, but you still feel warmth between the two of you. Food isn't even something a sleeper needs, even if they can consume it, but it's not about that. As Camille Butera wrote for Uppercut, the food in that moment means more than the base chemical structure that it holds. It means story, it means effort, it means two individuals taking a moment to enjoy something small and simple in tandem. It reminds us that food is not just a thing meant for continuing to move, but that the emotion linked to the food, the circumstances of preparation, bleed into the way that it sustains as well. Yes, over time you come to pay for the food Empress provides because it's only fair he gets something to live off of, but Citizen Sleeper still presents an idea that the body is more than the flesh, and it's worth sharing for reasons other than capital gains. You don't have to work for others, but with others. The theme of working with others is possibly most relevant to 7 Remake, a theme that is pretty par for the course in the world of RPGs. The real Final Fantasy is the frames we made along the way, or you know, whatever. Remake and 7 as a whole is about many things, but it's also about taking action in the face of doom. Cloud then acts as a vehicle for us as we learn about the world, initially someone who's pretty apathetic about what happens to it, possibly as a result of his soldier history training, or assumed training as you might eventually learn, leading him to value profit above all else. After all, he starts the game working as a merc working for Barrett on the game's opening assault on one of Shinra's Mako plants as a freelancer for all intents and purposes. He continues to work as a merc in the slums, completing various quests with the promise of Gil, the game's name for currency. It should be noted that, like Cyberpunk, you don't actually need to find work in order to survive. The only thing Cloud knows how to do with his altered stronger body is to make money, as that's what Soldier does for Shinra. Soldier might not directly put money in the pockets of Shinra's top brass, but they certainly perform missions that allow them to continue making money something which is a little bit more obvious in Crisis Core than it is in either 7 or 7 Remake, simply due to the fact that we spend time with a character who is a member of Soldier during the prequel story, not unlike how real world cops operate as protectors of capital as opposed to protectors of the general public. But over the course of Remake's story, Cloud meets more and more people, and slowly comes to understand them. More importantly, he starts to see what Barrett sees, which is a world worth fighting for. Luckily then, he has a body that allows him to fight on behalf of those who can't. Being a soldier requires you to sign over your life to Shinra, something which is again quite literal in the game's prequel, but Cloud's decisions lead him down a different path. With Cloud, his body itself becomes revolutionary, acting against the very purpose it was created for, keeping the status quo Shinra established intact. He becomes less preoccupied with making money as a merc, even if he still tries to retain his grumpy, cold persona to protect himself. It's not perfect, of course, as if you play the original Seven, you know Cloud isn't exactly an actual soldier, even if he has the abilities for one, but he is still somewhat abused by Shinra all the same. Cloud isn't the only one whose symbolic body is used as an attempt at financial gain though, as we have Aerith too. You see, Aerith is, arguably, an indigenous character, and the last of her people, the Cetra. While commonly referred to as the Ancients in modern times, the Cetra historically had a strong connection to the planet's life force, a concept you'd assumed to be metaphorical, but is actually very literal, named as the Lifestream in-game. Shinra wants to experiment on Aerith, to find a supposed promised land that may or may not exist, but is supposedly a place that only the Cetra know how to get to. You won't be surprised to hear that they don't want it for particularly positive reasons, but they're an evil corporation, what more do you expect? While Shinra might not be successful, as obviously Cloud and everyone else do save her for imprisonment late in the game, the corporation's actions do tell you a lot about how they view bodies. Dispensable is probably the best word in this case, as it doesn't matter if Aerith is the last of an indigenous group of people, there's, maybe, something inside of her that could lead to profit. I do think it should be made clear that when framing Aerith and the Cetra as an indigenous people, as is the case with many fantasy worlds, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one parallel. There might be some similarities between these fictitious characters and real indigenous groups, 
but I do think there are some interesting comparisons to be made all the same. Neither remake nor the original game have any kind of deep look at how the Cetra came to be wiped out as a people, though we are told about how at the very least. In the original game, it's explained that 2000 years ago when the Cetra would travel the planet, communicating with it in a literal sense, looking after it, an alien named Genova arrived. Genova in turn spread a virus that mutated the Cetra into monsters, with a few of those remaining managing to seal the alien away, at least for a period of time. You could easily view some parallels between this and European settler colonialism in America, particularly with how Europeans brought disease that indigenous Americans didn't have the means to treat properly. One of the parallels worth highlighting is that the Cetra are referred to as caretakers of the planet, often a descriptor that can be applied to indigenous people, even if it's one that's been somewhat forced upon them due to the literal need to protect the land. Think of cases in North America where indigenous peoples there are having to protect against oil pipelines, often leading the charge on such movements. These settler colonial themes carry through to the modern day, with Shinra continuing to exploit the land, taking its natural resources and turning it into Mako energy, surely leading to the planet's eventual death. Shinra are too built Midgar, and despite not directly in replacing the indigenous Cetra due to the majority of them already being dead, they are still occupying land that was never meant to be theirs. This ties back into my earlier point of how even individuals that aren't in charge aren't necessarily free of innocence. A settler is always a settler, and that has to be reckoned with no matter who you are. You can also again see how, while slightly ham-fisted, Final Fantasy VII does make a connection between environmental disaster and capitalism, and even further than that, how colonialism creates even tighter links between the three issues. Viewing the Cetra as an indigenous people, and subsequently looking at how they've all been but wiped out, feels like an important thing to do given how the game says that the actions that Shinra take aren't just ones that consume and exploit the planet, but it kills and exploits its very caretakers in quite a literal way. The ways in which Aerith's body is treated is then a different kind of exchange between body and capital, one that exemplifies how it's forced upon marginalised groups like indigenous peoples, though obviously in much more theatrical ways than our reality. With Aerith then, alongside Cloud and Barrett, you have a somewhat broad display of marginalised identities. Cloud's status as a marginalised identity is possibly more complicated, as in the original game he is overcome with Marco poisoning, essentially disabling him, and throughout Remake we see him experiencing flashes of pain that could too be viewed as chronic illness. On top of this, the town he comes from is in the middle of nowhere, seemingly devoid of a strong economy, so his class status comes into question too, though these are ideas we'll need to see explored in more depth in both Rebirth and whatever the third game will be called. It makes the game's message of collective action against your oppressor and fate itself all the more powerful, even if a lot of it is rough around the edges. But as also presented in both Cyberpunk and Citizen Sleeper, life is full of rough edges. I don't think we have to exclusively look at games that present various versions of the future to get an idea of what our bodies and their role in capitalism look like now. There are games which present similar ideas set in the now and even in the past, but all three of these games were released within the past four years, and while Cyberpunk and 7 Remake took the better part of a decade to even release, I do think they speak quite accurately on the here and now. I also think that when looking to Citizen Sleeper, we should start asking more of AAA games. I have a deep love for 7 Remake and an appreciation for Cyberpunk I didn't when I started working on this project but both of them can put some more conscious thought into how bodies are positioned in relation to the capitalist societies they present. There is of course the question of whether AAA games can ever achieve this, and with the honestly kind of foolish desire to create quadruple A games that some developers now have, it feels even less likely. Too many cooks spoil the broth after all. I'm not asking for perfection by any means, I don't believe in that as a concept when it comes to art of any kind, but I wish people would think about bodies as much as I do. More importantly, I wish they would think of them as difficult things to exist in, particularly when they're forced into positions of labour that are almost exclusively unfair. Looking back at what I've covered today, I also think more games should think about the kind of bodies they're presenting, and what they're saying when they present them in particular contexts. Cyberpunk is often messy with its handling of bodies, even if there are interesting moments to it, but it is hard to tell how much is purposeful and how much is incidental, given how messy of a development period it had. I also think it's possible that the themes of indigenous exploitation presented in Final Fantasy VII Remake are reading into it too much, as while there were some parallels are highlighted, and the original game does clearly borrow from indigenous American aesthetics, Without confirmation from the devs themselves, it's impossible to say what we should take from it. Though, it is a great game to play if you want to face off against capitalism with a giant ass sword. Games like Citizen Sleeper give me a lot of hope that we can be thoughtful about the role of the body and all of its imperfections it's born with, as well as those placed upon it. But it too isn't perfect. Thinking about our conversation surrounding racialization, are we meant to view these characters as racialized? Is the game trying to present a diverse world while sidestepping the issues that come with race and more focusing on pseudo-class dynamics? Or is it trusting us enough to not hold our hand through these things? Once again, it's hard to say. More than anything, what I wish from all of these games, all of which either now have or are receiving sequels, is that they use their imagination to really push the limits of what a body, specifically a body under capitalism, can look like, do, and be. Depicting the future in games is necessary, 
a political act potentially even, then we deserve radical presentations of our future and complex ideas of how we can move these virtual avatars through speculative worlds. How else are we meant to imagine our own futures without the help of others? Thank you so much for sticking with me right through to the end of this, I really appreciate you taking the time to do so for my first video on Game Assist. I also want to give a special thanks to our patrons, who we literally couldn't do this without. And as another reminder, you too can support us on either Patreon at patreon.com slash gameassistyt, or ko-fi at ko-fi.com slash gameassist, if you like the work we do here. You also shouldn't forget to follow us across all our socials, as the conversations surrounding these games and more don't stop with these videos. And of course if you enjoy the video, please make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing. That's all from me today, thank you once again, and please look after yourself.